Welcome once again to the Influencers Podcast. We are here to see the influence of your life grow. You have been equipped by your father to be a victor. Welcome to the Influencers Podcast. I'm Scott Young with co-host Dave Donaldson, who is out on assignment today. And I really want to encourage you to listen to today's podcast for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren, and just people you love. Because chances are you have recently interacted with some form of social media. In fact, you're listening to this podcast on some electronic device. And our guest today is an internet expert, and we're going to have a conversation about the many ways that we are being shaped, changed by social media, by social media, and how can we respond in faith, and what can we do? Chris Martin is a content marketing editor for Moody Publishers. He consults in social media, marketing, and communications. He regularly publishes his newsletter called Terms of Service. In fact, his website, which will be in the show notes, true termsofservice.social. And he's just published an amazing book that has just come out called The Wolf in Their Pockets, which we will be talking about. But Chris, just tell me, how do you become an internet expert? <laughs> well, uh, to be clear, I did not uh, call myself that. I <laughs> try not to think of myself in such ways. Um, but to be honest, like the answer to that question is I grew up on it. Um, so like the term digital native has become almost a cliche at this point. Um, but I was born in 1990 and in a sort of unique situation, I was born to a dad who worked for IBM. So, um, in the nineties, IBM was like Apple today, you know, kind of, I mean, they were the ones creating a lot of the devices that was bringing the, that were bringing the internet into the homes of millions of Americans. IBM was one of the biggest computer companies in the nineties. If anyone's listening and doesn't quite know why IBM significant, because they definitely have perhaps have less cultural influence today than they did way back then. And so as a very young child, um, my dad actually worked from home in the early nineties, uh, a local newspaper did a story on on us and our family that Joe Martin has a second landline set up so he can take his work phone calls as his son Christopher sits on his lap um and there's a little picture and everything and so uh, i you know i grew up with computers in my home i grew up with the internet in my home i remember getting on the internet in first grade and poking around to all before i knew how to get in trouble get in any sort of trouble you know i was just what is this it's so interesting and so I very much grew up on on the internet, um, and that obviously has its pluses and minuses. Plus is that I, you know, I get to be in the position I'm in today, and and really feel like like I've lived and breathed this stuff for as long as uh, anybody who's my age. Um, at the same time, you know, there's there's negatives. You you get you can get jaded. Um, you know, you, there's all there's all kinds of negatives with living online and growing up online. As more and more teenagers today are are experiencing what it means to grow up online. But um, I suppose I become an internet expert uh, for good or for ill very much by growing up on it from my earliest, my earliest ages. So, yeah. So those early computers, are, is this dial up that you were dialing oh, yeah. into the internet with? Oh, well, oh, yeah. some people. Would yeah, man, I can't tell you the number. I, I can't tell you the number of times my mom would yell at me to get off nickelodeon.com where i would you know because i was watching nickelodeon on tv and then oh i want to wait you mean my favorite tv channel has a website i wonder what's there and i'd pop over you know i'd take five minutes you know go get a snack while i'm connecting to the internet and it's making that awful screeching noise and then i'd finally get on the website and my mom would say hey my sister's trying to call me will you get off the internet you know and it's like oh but mom the site just loaded you know so oh yes i very much remember those days for sure and it probably took a while for the site to load as well. But those are the good old days. But you certainly have been around the Internet for a long time. You bring an interesting perspective to the conversation today. You have recently, this book has just come out, The Wolf in Their Pockets. Is to unpack what that name means. Uh, what's the book about? And uh, what needs does this book address? Sure. So... Uh, the name just came about because as I was, um, I'd actually just finished 
uh, the first draft, if I remember correctly, of my first book on social media called Terms of Service. Mm -hmm. And I had already started hearing that there needed to be a social media book for leaders. Basically, how can leaders lead people when people seem to be shaped and discipled by social media more than their mm -hmm. pastors or church leaders. And so I knew terms of service, my first book wasn't going to be just for leaders. It was going to be kind of for everybody. So I already started kind of brainstorming what would a book for leaders regarding matters of social media look like? And pastors, church leaders are referred to as shepherds um, mm -hmm. and shepherds guard, guard sheep against wolves. You know, that's one of the things they do. They lead sheep along, keep them in line, but also keep the sheep protected from wolves. And the kind of the image that came to my head as I was formulating these first ideas was, I wonder if a lot of shepherds maybe don't realize that their sheep are carrying wolves around in their pockets. Mm -hmm. um, shepherds are you know, often concerned with keeping wolves away from the sheep and the, sh the, the sheep are here, the wolves are over there. Wolves, you stay over there and the sheep will be here and we've got no problem. But I think maybe what a lot of pastors and church leaders, parents even, don't realize is the the folks that they're trying to shepherd, uh, the, the wolves aren't coming in from the outside. They've already infiltrated and are, are being carried around by the sheep themselves. And so um, that's kind of where the idea came from. I think I only mm -hmm. used that image maybe once in the actual book. It's not like it's, you know, it's not like the book is all about that. Um, but it is about it thematically. And so I, I was surprised mm -hmm. when my publisher decided to keep the title because it's a little cute and sometimes cute titles don't really work, but um, but they kept it. And, 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 uh, and so that's, that's how, where that came from. The, the book is really the best way to describe it is like this. Um, I, I lead in the student ministry at my local church. I've been leading in student ministry for a long time. So I have a lot of conversations with parents about this. I also have a lot of conversations with pastors and other lay church leaders who are leading in their community groups or things like that. Um, and I heard, like I just said a minute ago, I heard a need for people who were thinking, man, my teenager is listening to this influencer on YouTube way more than he's listening to me, his mom, or, Hey, I'm a pastor. And I feel like I'm hearing more and more people, you know, coming up to me after church services, asking about some wacky thing they heard on the internet, uh, despite the truth and wisdom that I try to give them on Sunday morning. And it feels like they're being discipled by social media more than they're being discipled by me or their time in God's word. And so I was recognizing through a lot of conversations with pastors, parents, and church leaders that there is a, we, ha we have a sort of formation problem. We have a worldview formation problem, a discipleship mm -hmm. problem. And um, I've been studying social media. Like I, I kind of joked, I grew up with this stuff. And that's part of maybe what makes me an expert. But I've worked, my whole career has been in helping Christian organizations use social media effectively, like in a way mm -hmm. that shines the light of the gospel and pushes back the darkness that that lives everywhere online. And so I was I've I've spent so much time kind of practically how do we use social media effectively from a very tactical standpoint. And I started studying a lot more the sort of sociological and spiritual effects of like how does social media affect how we relate to each other? How does social media affect how we think about truth, how we think about faith? And as I started to study that, I realized that yeah, there there really is a need for a book that, you know, The Wolf in Their Pockets, a lot of people said it's a social media book. Well, kind of. But honestly, mm -hmm. this book is as much a leadership book and a discipleship book as it is a mm -hmm. book about social media, because it's really how do you lead and disciple people who seem to be led and discipled by social media more than the people who are actually in and among them in their lives. Um, and so that's this book is meant to be a sort of tool in the tool belt of parents, pastors, church leaders who feel like they don't know how to disciple the people they love as much as social media is discipling the people they love. And so my hope is that this book kind of serves as a tool toward that end. So I like the metaphor of wolf. Wolf is a danger word. We all know a wolf in sheep clothing means that there's a danger that is unseen. Um, so if there's a danger in our pockets, in our social media devices, what is the danger that we have to be aware of? Um, there are a lot of them. There are 13 chapters in the book, and I highlight 13 different ways, I think, our relationship with social media and the social internet more broadly is a danger to us. And I think there are, there are some that come to the fore and perhaps are more prominent than others. Throughout this process, 
I was in regular contact with a dozen or more at, at various stages, pastors, church leaders, and parents. Because while I have experience as a youth ministry leader, and I have a lot of friends who are pastors, and I speak with a lot of parents of teenagers, um, I don't ever want to assume that my experience is the same as everyone else's experience, right? We're all in different contexts. We all have different life experiences and and all of that. And And social media is just such a personal thing. I mean, that's kind of part of the appeal is we all have our own experiences on these platforms. Mm -hmm. And so everyone has, you know, when I go speak somewhere and they're like, hey, you have an hour to speak to this group of parents. I always say, okay, I'm going to blab for 15 minutes, but then we're going to have 45 minutes of Q&A because I know that that's going to be way more helpful than me just assuming we're all on the same page because everybody's at a different spot with all of this stuff. And so um, I have found that it's really helpful to talk about these things um, as specifically as possible and address a lot of the needs uh, that that arise. And so um, I've spoken to many pastors and church leaders. And uh, in my experience, the biggest issues are, you know, if I could pick two or three of the chapters that mm-hmm. are um, maybe most important based on what I heard from pastors in the development of this book, uh, reject conspiracy theories. When I asked, I sent out a survey at the beginning of writing this book. I had a kind of a rough draft of the table of contents. And I said, Hey, here's what I'm imagining could be in this book, but you pastors and church leaders, tell me if you think anything's missing. And -hmm. if you think there's one topic that I definitely need to cover, tell me what you think that is. And 100% of the respondents in that survey said, you must talk about conspiracy theories and social media, because I may be heard about one or two conspiracy theories from my congregation a year. And now Mm -hmm. I'm hearing three or four a month. And a lot of that is because of things going on in the world and whatever else. But I talk about this in the book, and so I don't need to go into total depth about it here. But social media really fans the flame of conspiracy, unlike any form of media in human history. And there's Mm -hmm. a lot of reasons for that. At at its core is we consume content. We consume a volume of content, like Mm -hmm. an amount of content that we, I think we're never meant to consume and we consume it at a speed that makes figuring out the truth nearly impossible. And so we just swipe from video to video or tweet to tweet, and it becomes very difficult to figure out what's true and what's not. And we just sort of start taking things at face value if we're not careful. So that chapter I, I think is very important because it's the, it's the one that everybody told me I couldn't leave out. I think the chapter on anxiety Um, anxiety, especially among young people, there continues to be mountains of data linking increased social media use and increased mental health issues among teenagers, especially teen girls. And the social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, is amazing at talking about this. He's not a believer, but believers can easily take what he says about the effects of social media on teen girls and see how it's affecting the teenagers in their lives and their, their churches. That chapter's huge, especially if you care about teenagers. And I think, I think the chapter about how it's reforming the ways we think about sex is super important. Um, not only when you think about the internet and sex, you think immediately about pornography. And naturally, that's, that's a topic that is prominent and, and important to talk about and to not avoid. But frankly, just re- evolving values and, and, and views of, of human sexuality have just been so shaped and and deformed by our relationship with social media. And I think that's only going to become more relevant. Um, it's more relevant than it's ever been, and it's only going to become more relevant. So I think that chapter is, is important as well. So those are a few of the topics that I heard a lot of feedback about in the mm-hmm. early parts of the writing process. And then when I sent the book, the first draft, to a handful of pastors, those were the chapters that they said really seemed to be some of the most important and sort of urgent, if you will. Um, all, I, I don't want to play favorites. I think the others are important too, but those are the ones I heard the most feedback on for sure. So when you're a youth leader, a student ministries leader, and uh, let's just drill down a little bit on anxiety and depression, especially with young ladies, uh, you are leading students. Um, how do you, you're in that way shepherding, how does the pastor of a church shepherd, especially adolescents, um, to avoid anxiety, depression? Is it as simple as just deleting an app? Like what, what advice do you give? Or there's a, there's a mother that's listening or a grandmother and they're saying, how do I help my daughter? Yeah. Um, I think a good first step is examining 
you know, let's assume you're a, you're a parent and you're recognizing your child, your teen girl is really struggling with anxiety and or depression or, or, or related mental health crisis. I think addressing social media use is one of the first things that should happen. Now I have, I'm not a parent of a teenager. So anyone listening, if that immediately makes me irrelevant, then you can stop listening. But again, I've been working in student ministry for over a decade. So I, I get this from the, from a sort of secondhand perspective. And I've talked to a lot of parents about this over the years. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter. Uh, and so this will become a very relevant issue for me very soon, sooner than I would like. Yep. Um, even, even if I limit her social media use, it will still be a thing. And so yep. I think about this a lot. Um, I think if you, if you're a parent whose, whose daughter or teenager in general is using, is, is struggling with mental health, I would address social media use immediately. Um, mm -hmm. like I, I just cited social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt. He's at New York university. He's one of the most well-respected social psychologists in the world right now. And he has for the last few years been really chasing this issue of mental health, social media use and, and teen girls because um, new data from the CDC just came out a few weeks ago and it's biannual youth risk behavior survey, which showed that most teen girls, 57% of teen girls now say that they experience persistent sadness or hopelessness, which is up from 36% in 2011. So up 21% in 12 years. And then 30% of teen girls now say they have seriously considered suicide, which is up from 19% in 2011. So that's another 11% wow. in 12 years. That is shocking. Wow. And for wow. a long time, Jonathan Haidt has been saying, um, there's a lot of data to show that there's a correlation between increased social media use and increased mm -hmm. mental health issues among teen girls. But from, and I'm not a psychologist or a researcher, so I'm going to trust someone like him more than my own brain. But he has said, even though there's a lot of evidence, it's, there's not enough to show a causative relationship, just a correlation. Um, mm -hmm. So generally what that means, if you don't know this jargon is there, yeah, there seems to be a relationship here, but it doesn't say, it's not enough to say that this causes this. Well, with this newest data from the CDC, Jonathan Haidt has basically said, I'm confident. I, I, I'm willing to put my reputation out there and say now, this is a major, like social media use is a major cause of mental health issues in teen girls. And I, he's a lot smarter on this than I am. So I would direct anyone, especially to a book called The Coddling of the American Mind that he mm -hmm. and Greg Lukianoff authored, which is tremendous. And they, even though they're not dealing with this newest data, the book was published three or four years ago, they dive into this topic a bit with the data that was available then. And he's a lot smarter on that book. But in general, why teen girls? Well, the way, the way he summarizes it, is that teen girls resolve conflict socially in ways that are exacerbated by social media a lot mm -hmm. more than how teen boys resolve conflict. Much more likely using, like stereotypically, much more likely that teen boys are going to resolve conflict by punching each other in the face or, you know, wrestling each other mm -hmm. or, or something yeah. like that. Whereas teen girls are more likely to backstab, socially ostracize, things that are a lot more easily exacerbated by social media. And so that's why they're disproportionately affected. At least that's his theory. And I think it's a logical one. Yeah. And so if I were a parent of a teenager going through this, I would first address what's my teenage girl's relationship with social media, with Instagram. If we're, if we're looking at a body image issue, Instagram, especially if we're looking at a bullying or, or social sort of ostracization issue, looking at Snapchat, where there's a lot more back and forth socialization going on. Um, so I would address that. And, and let me say this. I would be very careful to address that in a gracious way and not a sort mm -hmm. of like accusatory way. Um, we're all teenagers, especially, but we're all, I think, prone to get defensive about our social media use, frankly, because it's an idol for many of us. And we always get defensive about protecting our golden calves. And so if you go after a teenager and say, what do you think you're doing using Instagram? I'm going to take away your phone or I'm going to, you know, disable it to, to, and you just kind of, you attack. Um, I think you're going to you're going to erode a lot of trust with that teenager. You're going to seem like you're punishing them rather than trying to care for them. And so I I would encourage a parent toward hey if you find that your teenager teenage girl is having a, an unhealthy relationship with social media and that may be contributing to the mental health crisis that you're that you're seeing ha have a measure of come along sideness here rather than yeah. like punishment. Um, and so and so that's what I would say and and I would. Uh, you know, beyond that, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't want to say other ways that you should maybe treat mental health issues among your teen girl, find, find a good mentor that isn't you find another woman in your church. If, if you're connected to a church who can 
care for your teen girl, disciple your teen girl. That would be very effective. Finding formal counseling could be very effective. Um, but uh, generally, regard with regard to social media, I think you have to. You have. There's just too much evidence now to not first look at your teen's relationship with social media if you think you have a teen who may be struggling with uh, persistent sadness, depression, anxiety, things like that. There was, those were very sad statistics that you uh, quoted. You mm -hmm. may know this as well. Ab about how many hours does the average person turn on their screen and cruise social media? Yeah, the average American adult spends two and a half hours per day on social media. And this is why I feel very confident in the book saying that social media is the chief discipler of our age. If the average American adult is spending two and a half hours a day on social media, um, we don't spend two and a half hours a day doing anything except sleeping and working or sleeping and going to school if you're a, a student. Um, you don't spend two and a half hours a day eating meals, probably, unless you're going out for a, a long dinner or date or something. You don't spend two and a half hours a day reading unless you have a lot more free time than I do. Perhaps you get to do that. Um, you don't spend two and a half hours a day going to the gym unless you know, you're know you the next Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. Um, you're spending two and a half hours a day sleeping and doing whatever your primary occupation is as a student or, or worker of some kind. Um, and so two and a half hours a day is a lot. Um, and so if, if the average American is spending that much time on social media, it's certainly the cheap, nobody's spending two and a half hours a day reading their Bible, probably, unless they're doing like sermon prep or something like that. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a, that's an important statistic to keep in mind. And, and let's be clear, because I think one of the biggest problems that I've run into as I've spent the last few years writing and talking about social media a lot is I think one of the biggest reasons that the church has a poor relationship with social media is because we've relegated it to the youth room. Um, like we've made this a young person issue as if it's still 2006. It's not 2006 anymore. The boomers in your big church on Sunday morning are being discipled by Facebook just as much as the Gen Zers who get together on Wednesday nights for youth group are being discipled by TikTok. Both groups are being discipled. Like this stat of two and a half hours a day is among American adults. Mm -hmm. That means that the only student that's really captured, the only kid in your youth group is going to be your senior. So could, could that number be higher among teenagers? Yeah, but it also could be lower because a lot of teenagers probably aren't using it at all because their parents don't let them. And so if the average adult is spending two and a half hours, that's not a youth ministry issue. That's a, that's a main, a, you know, a main church issue or, a, you know, not, not only a young person issue. So keep that in mind as well. If you happen to be a pastor or a church leader listening I speak to a lot of youth groups and, and parents, uh, but I think we need to be careful not to relegate this matter just to the youth group. So if social media is discipling and you've said such a predominant voice in discipleship, how do we counteract that, overcome that? How do pastors, student leaders like yourself, how do we disciple like Jesus would like us to be discipling? Um, I think practically speaking, we have to not be as reliant on programs and sermons as maybe the church has been in the past in wielding its influence. Mm. Um, because if the average American spends two and a half hours a day on social media, I forget the most recent statistic. It was probably either Barna or Lifeway who did something like this, but like the, a really good, active Christian in a local church is probably spending two hours a week in your local church. Maybe um, they might only be spending one hour a week participating in the life of the local church because people skip and you know, all of that, they're maybe not a part of a Wednesday night thing or midweek, whatever your midweek situation looks like. Like, like the average American Christian is probably spending an hour a week in church. If they're really active an hour a week in church or two hours a week in church cannot hold a candle to two and a half hours a day on social media. And so if you think that, oh, I just got to get more people in the church building and that'll help curb this problem. I, I think you're wrong as kindly as I can say that. I think that's, I think what, what the, the sort of posture I've adopted toward this regard in, in my student ministry experience, cause that's where I'm doing my most direct sort of ministry in this regard 
is I, every time I get the students together and I think about, you know, how can I help them with regard to the relationship with social media and, and all of that, I want to use our time together not to just imbue theological knowledge to them and say, you know, uh, let me teach you the theology from James chapter two tonight at youth group. Like that is helpful. Like I just last night, we're recording on a Thursday. Just last night I taught in, from Daniel seven, which was definitely an eye opener for a lot of the kids in the student ministry. We were talking about beasts and horns and all kinds of visions and that kind of thing. And it was, a, it was a wacky time last night. And did I try to teach them? Hey, here's what Daniel seven means. Here's who the son of man is. Yes, totally. But also a significant portion of our time is around, let me try to equip you to be engaging scripture and engaging your relationship with God on your own throughout the week. I think the way, the most effective way a church is going to, and, and leaders of a church, parents even, are going to disciple people to compete, if you will, with the discipleship that's happening on social media is not going to be through a sermon series or a men's breakfast or a youth hangout at church or something like that. All of that's very good. And by all means do those things. But I think we should try if we can to use the gathered times as the body of Christ to be equipping people in their personal devotions, in their personal spiritual disciplines, because I think you fight the battle of being discipled by social media at five o'clock on a Tuesday morning, more than you fight it at, nine o'clock on a Sunday morning. I think you fight it in your personal devotions, in your regular time in the word, in your observance of other spiritual disciplines, um, more than you fight it just with the gathered church. And I think gathering is important. We should continue to do that. I'm not saying by any means that that's not, but I think when you get together, we should be spending a lot more time as church leaders, equipping people, equipping the saints um, to, to follow Christ throughout the week, rather than just, educating them on a Sunday morning. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but, but I think that is something I think could be really effective toward this end. I know I recently, I pastored a church and I, and not with any real push, I just said, let's close our eyes. And I just want to get a sense of where you are. Um, how many of you are having a daily time with God? And it wasn't great. So we just know as yeah. leaders, we need to address exactly the things you're talking about. And Chris, I want to thank you. I want to encourage people to get a copy or to get a copy for your pastor, your leader, your shepherd of the wolf in their pockets. Uh, we'll put in the show notes how to connect with uh, Chris, how to um, uh, follow his newsletter, Terms of Service, which comes out, and just to connect with this very important topic. Um, because your kids, your grandkids are being discipled and you should be aware of what voices are in their head. And of course, the voice we'd like to be in their head is the voice of the Holy Spirit. Chris, I want to thank you for being with us today. Appreciate your time and just the uh, incredible amount of information that you brought to us. I want to encourage all our friends who are listening to continue to be influences where you live, to let light come out of you, to overcome darkness, to let hope come out of you, to overcome hopelessness, to be salt in a world that needs your flavor. For the Influencers Podcast, I'm Scott Young. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Influencers Podcast on the Charisma Podcast Network. If you enjoy our content, we would love for you to subscribe and have the opportunity to tune in to future podcasts. You can follow us on all social media platforms at the Influencers Podcast Official. You can stay up to date, hear more inspiring content, and unlock your full potential as an influencer. Remember to use your influence to create lasting change that draws the world closer to Jesus.